Good afternoon, everyone. So, uh, welcome back to our simulation modeling two, week two study journey. I I think that some of you already practiced the first uh, lab section in the morning today, right? So, although the uh, graduate teaching assistant told me like not too many people will really show up in today's section, but I hope that this not going to happen in the future section. But I believe those are very important sections for uh, you to complete the course projects for this project, I mean for this unit. Today we are going to learn um, those uh, pin jointed frames and trusses and how you're going to solve in a more complicated problem compared to what we did uh, last week for those uh, one dimensional spring system. And again, Let's uh, review what we did for the final item analysis is actually uh, trying to mathematically formulate a problem and trying to give a general way so it turns out you're able to use a program to help you to solve in those uh, very complicated problems by uh, solving linear systems. So as long as you are able to derive those uh, governing equations, you are somehow able to connect things together by assemble those element-based uh, stiffness matrix into a system, stiffness matrix, so turns out that you are able to uh, solve all those problems. So as what I listed here, this is repeated slides, what I showed in week one already, it's like, no matter what is the, the problem, physical problem is, as long as you are able to uh, convert those governing equations to uh, somehow convert them into a local formula which describes the relationship between the so-called force and the displacement, or the loading and displacement, or uh, any of those boundary conditions and those uh, deformation or physical parameters you are trying to evaluate, you are able to uh, derive those element matrix and try to solve it, okay? Before you come to here, I suppose you have already go through those uh, pre-lecture videos online, which is somehow re related to, or uh, is going to be a further checking here by the content we are going to learn here today. So the first concept, what we are going to uh, cover today, is trying to uh, making the 1D problems more general to trying to solve in the 2D problem. So actually, the similar process for, for generalization is able to help you to extend the 2D problems into a 3D problems. So it's basically, what we did is like we are trying to introduce a kind of a very general relationship between a local and a global frame coordinates and how to somehow making the element stiffness matrix which is originally derived in the local coordinate system into the global coordinate system. So it turns out you're able to assemble everything together, okay? So let's look at one bar or one truss, which is uh, part of those uh, connected frame system. So let's say looking at this bar, which is linking between node one and three. So it's basically, we're able to uh, define a local coordinate system. So if you look at this bar, it's kind of rotated by an alpha angle. So basically, you can find like the original coordinate system in the bus system is actually along the bar direction we have the XL axis, I mean along this direction, and then we have YL along this direction. So basically that is the, as what I'm showing here on this figure, that's the local frame of this uh, truss structure, right? So the only thing what we did is like we rotated by the alpha angle. And then, we somehow need to link up the local frames with, link it up with those uh, global frames which have, uh, say, X and Y coordinate, which is uh, the water coordinate system, okay? And now we need to derive what's the relationship between the XL, YL, and XG and YG. When you say L means the local, when you say G means global, right? So that's the meaning of those uh, subscripts. And you'll find like you can easily convert between this local frame and the global frame by this uh, rotation matrix. I think rotational 
relationship. This is very easy to derive. It's like if you have any point which is defined by XL and YL in the local code in the system, so basically let's say any points here, so basically you are able to convert this into a point which is projected onto the Y, I want the XG and the YG. So if you have, uh, say, XL, YL, that means you have uh, something, maybe I can, I can draw a picture, it's better to explain it to you. Let me turn on the visualizer a little bit. So, on the left and right, it shows the formula. I hope this comes out soon. So how this formula is derived is pretty much based on, yeah, I know, so I just want to show. So how, how I did it, it's like if you have, say, XG and you have a YG, and then you have another local frame, say, XL and YL, right? So this is what I, This is what I join here. And then let's say if we have one particular point, which is uh, here in the local coordinate system. And then that's why when we say local coordinate system, that means this lens actually gives this x coordinate in a local coordinate system. And then this lens is actually gives us a y coordinate in the local coordinate system, right? OK. So basically, what do you know? It's like, you know, this is the alpha. Now, you would like to convert this XL and YL into, you need to project this point onto, say, XG and YG. So that is basically what we need to do to convert the coordinate system between the local and the global. Right? So if you look at the formula which is shown on the right, so basically when you have XL, so what it means, if you look at here, what is the this part of XL cosine alpha? What's that? So when you have alpha here, doesn't mean that you also have alpha here. This is also alpha, right? Yeah, OK. So what is XL cosine alpha? It's actually this lens, right? Right? OK. So what is the YL sine alpha? What's YL? Yes? Exactly, yeah, that's, that's, that's the thing, okay? So it's basically, based on this kind of projection, you're able to somehow convert those XL, YL into, what I say, this is our XG we are going to obtain, and then this part is our YG we are going to obtain, right? So basically, that's, that's how this formula derives. You you, if you want to do it by yourself, you can go back to to derive this, it's very easy to, to obtain that. And then I'd like to move back. So more important things like what we are going to do after we have this, okay. So it's very important like we're able to do the projection or the transformation from local coordinate system into global and also from a global into, into a local. That is quite an inverse kind of uh, a transformation which is easy to be derived, okay? Now, let's consider about, with the help of this transformation matrix, how are we able to convert those elements 
equations which are originally derived in the local coordinate system onto those are global coordinate system. Let's consider about arbitrary oriented truss structure like this. So we have this. But no matter how all the say stiffness matrix what we derive is actually in the frame of this, right? Last week we only derive anything related to two node but one D. So this is what we derived last week is two node P I P J and 1D problem. Okay, so we only have those the force along the axial direction, also only have the displacements along the axial direction. So this is what we derived last time. But left and right, I and J, two components. So the thing, what we wish to do is like, what about we put it in the arbitrary kind of coordinate system? So along this, axial direction actually contribute to the global coordinate system both x and y, right? Right. You put it as arbitrary orientation. So the elongation and the force in the local coordinate system, although it is only considered about xl, but for the global coordinate system, it contributes to both xg and yg. So now we need to derive the relationship between this xl and the global xg and yg. So that is basically the most important part to uh, making all those formulas very general. Okay. So this is the way how we did. I will explain it in a little bit more details. So first of all, according to the formula what we derived just now, so we are able to convert XL into XG and we are also able to convert XGYG into XL. Okay. And if you apply to here, so if we have XG and YG, because why we say that? Because in the end, when you have multiple frames or multiple trusses assembled together, we need to using a quite a unique coordinate to, to all the truss structures. So that is the global coordinate system. Okay. So everything we derive here, we need to convert them into the coordinate, I mean the global coordinate system based uh, representation. So this is how, why we need to do this. So basically if we find like, if we have XG and YG, and then we project, of course, we project both XG and YG onto the axial direction. So we have XL equal to xg cosine alpha, because this is alpha, for example, and then yg sine alpha, and then that means uh, you project onto here, right? And use this equation, we are able to extend it to, say, both the i node and the j node, right? So for any of the force, which is applied along this direction, is actually combined by the force along the x direction and g direction. So basically it's a combined force. But we need to project the force onto the axial direction. So that is what we did here. And then we have both the i node, when we have a force Pxi, Pyi, we need to project both of them onto the axial direction. Again, this angle is alpha, okay? Where I put my mouse, this is alpha. And of course, if you say you have a per perpendicular line join, which is, uh, you draw a line perpendicular to the axial direction, you have alpha here, okay? This is also alpha. So you have, that's why you have the projection force of a px, py onto the axial direction, which is easy to understand. And then to benefit the later more general representation, we would like to extend it a little bit of this formula into a matrix representation. So basically, Pix is equal to this one, alpha x times Pix, sine alpha, uh, cosine alpha times Pix, and cosine alpha times, uh, sorry, cosine alpha times Pix, plus the sine alpha times the Pyi. So basically this, and plus zero times this, and zero times this. All this, the first row times this vector is obtained from this formula.
And then the second row would do the same thing, like this one, this one, this one, this one, and times multiplied by this vector, we obtain from this formula, which is for the second row. So easy to understand, I suppose. Okay? And then this is about the force. And then we could do the same thing for our, say, this is for what we have just now, and then we need to further extend this for the, say, displacement. So when we have displacement, and then that means to two nodes, you're going to have four components, right? Force the same. It's like we have the component for i, both x and y direction. We have component for j, both x and y direction. But restrictly speaking, I mean, both the local and the global 2D coordinate have, uh, let's say, two components for each of the node. So basically, in total, we have four by four. We have, we, we are going to have a four by four matrix because there is a four degree of freedom which is involved in this particular element, right? So that means we should somehow making the local forces should be described by PIX, PIY, PJX, PIY, PJY. Although, for this particular element, because there is no force, there is no transversal force, okay, on the node. So basically, PIY, PJY, for this particular element, is always zero, right? And then, so this is what, what we did for that. And then, we are able to somehow make it a very general transfer matrix which is covered both I parts. So basically, we're using this part to do the transformation between the local coordinate system into the global by applying it to the, the, the I node. And then this part of the transformation matrix is applied to the J node. Okay. And then what we are going to do with the help of this uh, transformation matrix, it's like, let's see, we have this already. And then we have this, the force, the local force, which is actually this one. And this is the global force, right? And then we have this local force, which is equal to T times the global force vector. Okay, so this is the, the first formula, what do we have? Okay. Similarly, we can apply this to the displacement as well. The same thing, right? Force and displacement. The same concept. And with the help of that, what do we derive for the element, which has happened in the local coordinate system. So basically we have a PU, lowercase p, PL, is actually equal to the K matrix times UL, right? This all happens in the local coordinate system. So we have PL equal to KL. KL is like the KK minus K minus K, that one. Okay, so we have this, okay? And you say, oh, different. You have a, you have a two, you have a four by four matrix here. Originally, I, I only have a two by two. But don't forget, I, what I mentioned just now is like, we can introduce the Y component by assuming it's kind of uh, zero, right? So what I did here, many of those students confused, is just now you mentioned like transformation matrix is actually uh, four by four, but here your K is kind of uh, two by two. Okay, let's say what do I did. So the original, original K, where's my K? KL is actually a kind of, let's say, K, K, minus K, and the minus K, right? But this only given for the local coordinate system xi, xj, right? This is xi, this is xj, 
Okay. Now we would like to expand it into a system have both x and y, but y part is zero. So what we did is like we introduced some of the dummy elements. So basically we converted them into k like this. So we have a ki and a yi. We have a kj, a xj, and a yj. And that gives you a formula, say, this is xi, this is uh, yi, this is xj, and then we have yj. So basically, this is corresponding to xi and uh, xj, right? So we have xi and xj. So this minus k is placed here. And then this minus k is corresponding to xj and uh, xi. So it's like xj, xi. So this minus k comes to here. And what is this k? Because xj and uh, xj. So basically, this k comes to xj, and xj comes to here. So what I should I do for the rest? Because all the displacements and the forces for this structure along the local coordinate system, any component related to y are zero. So we simply can put in them a zero there. Okay. But of course, again, this happens in the local coordinate system XL. YL. Okay. Now we need to convert this one from local coordinate system. Oh, sorry. I can see it. We need to convert them from local coordinate system into the global. So this one, this is a 4 by 4 one, is the KL, which I applied here okay, on this formula. Okay. If you look at left and right. So as PL is equal to KL, UL is actually, this is the KL. It, it is an expanded one, including both X and Y. Okay. So if you look at left and right, what I did, now I would like to convert them back into the global coordinate system. So because we have this, and we also have this, so we substitute this one and this one to the left and the right of this formula. Okay? That's why we have this. Right? Now, we would like a both sides of this linear system multiplied by the inverse of t, left of multiplication of an inverse of t. So basically, the inverse of t times t gives you the identity matrix, right? And then you have this. So what do you have now? You have the relationship between PG and UG, both in the global coordinate system. Okay? And then this formula, which is shown here, the inverse of T times KL times T is actually giving you the element stiffness matrix, a general form in the global coordinate system. Okay? So which is uh, give you the general form, and then you are able to program it. Because once you have the general form, whatever thing related to the K, KL is something I, I join here, right? I join here. This is KL. What is T? T is this. So no matter what is the orientation of, uh, of your elements, as long as you know the alpha, as long as you know the material which is supplied here, that is coefficient k, you are able to derive its element stiffness matrix in the global coordinate system, which is quite easy. Okay? And you say, well, calculating the inverse of t is quite uh, complicated. I, how, how should I do that? And then the transformation matrix itself have uh, kind of, so this is the, the global, you know, uh, stiffness matrix. Let's say the transformation matrix, if it's a pure rotational matrix, and then this matrix is actually orthonormal. So what does orthonormal mean? It's like any of those row components or the 
like a column component, you pick it as a vector, is a kind of a unit vector that is a normal matrix, right? So any of these, any of the two of these kind of vectors you pick out, dot product gives you zero, means they are always orthogonal to each other, essentially also normal matrix property. And then the nice property of an orthonormal matrix is like it's transpose, it's actually it's inverse. Okay? So the inverse of T is actually equal to the transpose of T, which is very easy to obtain. So the inverse of T is actually the transpose, it's a mirror copy of T, right? So which is uh, easily to obtain. I, I, I suppose you already learned this in many of the other courses, I hope, at least. And then if you don't, it's going to repeatedly learn this in the, whatever the dynamics courses or robotics courses or the, the modeling courses, everything related to this uh, rotational matrix and transformation matrix, okay? And so with the help of that, so basically you are very easily to obtain a global stiffness matrix, okay? So far so good, I hope. Any questions? I'll call my PC back. So, and then, I know you guys are trying to uh, really practice again by uh, simple examples. So let's move into a simple example, how this is going to be used in, in, the, in the study, okay? Let's start from this. Okay, let's see, we have a system with a two bar. Okay. So actually we have a system with a two bar. One is like the element one, which are linking the node the one and the two with the length three meters, okay? And then this using a material which is the, let's say the stiffness, which is 10, uh, I think it's uh, MN, right? Divided by meters. So this is, uh, this is like the element one, stiffness coefficients. And then we have another element Element two, we shall link a node two and three, which is using a different material, okay? Which is less strong and than element one. So basically, this one's element two, so stiffness coefficient is five, okay? So now we would like to go through the final element analysis practice, just how, how to solve this problem. So giving a force at node two, which will give you a 10, uh, thousand, 10,000 Newton. And then so basically, let's say what we did. So first of all, you are able to already derive an element stiffness matrix like this, but this happened in the local coordinate system, right? So this is the thing what we derived last time. So basically, nodal force, nodal displacement, U1, U1 and U2. And then again, as what I did here on the paper, and you are able to extend it from a uh, loading system or element system only happens along the axial direction to a general formula by introducing a trivial y component, O0, right? So this is the first thing you could do. And then the good thing of this element because it's uh, placed uh, exactly horizontal. So basically you don't need to trans-rotate the animal. It's already in the global coordinate system. This is for the element one. Okay, so that's a good. So let's do element two. So for element two, you have this P2 and P, P2 and P3, right? So you have two and three. Let's say, let's just suppose element two is a point from two to three. So basically this is node I, this is node J. So what is the, what is the alpha, the rotation angle? Should be more than 180 degree, right? So it should all the way rotate from this side to the other side, okay? So you need to make that clear. And then we have P2 and P3, which is equal to this one, try to using the new coefficients as a series coefficients and U2 and U3. And then we extend it into a local coordinate system by introducing the Y component. Again, it's a trivial component of Y, making them O0, okay? So you have this. And then don't forget what we did last time to giving each of this 
call to to give each of these column and also the row an index. So basically, this is for node two x, for node two y, this is for node three x, node three y, and node two x, node two y, node three x, node three, node three y. Okay, so this is what's the meaning of each row and each column. And then this also indicate where you should put them, why you assemble them together into the global system when you have multiple elements involved, right? So this index is extremely important for you to give that. And then, as what I mentioned just now, you luckily have element one, which is not rotated. So basically, the transformation matrix of element one is actually the identity matrix, right? Because alpha equal to zero. You don't rotate it at all. But for element two, it's different because you basically, you have a certain angle alpha all the way rotated, say, the local x into this orientation along the element two, okay? So if you're looking at the, the lens, so this is three meters, four meters, so basically that means what? This lens is actually three square plus a four square and a square root, that gives you five, right? So the length of the element two is five meter. So that's why we have this is three, this is uh, five, this is four, okay? So you're getting the angle theta, and this theta plus 180 degree, you have the angle of alpha, okay? And then you're calculating the cosine alpha and sine alpha. And then you apply this into the transformation matrix. So you have this transformation matrix, right? Okay. Now you are able to somehow making this K into a element stiffness matrix, that means KG in the global coordinate system, right? And by using T, by using this formula, I have to say, you have KL, which is the minus five, five, what do we derive just now with a few zeros, and you have the transpose transformation matrix, and then you have transformation matrix. Time them together, you're going to have the global one. So this is something you need to solve. But before you really doing the assembly and solving the whole thing, I suggest you do one more step in trying to marking down the boundary conditions. So if you're looking at this problem, so what are the boundary conditions applied to this problem? Boundary condition always combined by the displacement and the force. What is the, what is the external loading given to nodal two? 10. 10k Newton, right? Point downwards. So that means P2x is equal to zero. PQy equal to, he said 10. How about others? Minus 10. Okay, this is orientation, okay? This is direction, minus 10, okay? And then, what about, this will, this will be a very tricky question. What about P1X and P1Y? Do you know it? No idea, right? You need to solve it, and you need to determine it. So that is not a boundary condition. Boundary condition is the same thing you definitely need to know, you definitely already know, which is going to impose into the linear system, help you making a singular linear system into non-singular, into full rank. So what else? What are the else boundary conditions we already know? P1, X, P1, Y, we don't know. What about P3, X, P3, Y? Do you know it? Not yet. What else? U2, X, U2, Y, do we know it? 
So I'm going to say, well, it's, a, it's a rigid. You no, here we're talking about elastic frames. So basically, U2X, U2Y, you don't know because it's going to deform, right? Yes. Right, one and two are locked. So basically, that is a boundary condition. We have U1 and U3. Both X and Y are known, right? So we have uh, U1x, U13 equal to 0. We have uh, U1x, U1y equal to 0. We have U3x, U3y are both equal to 0 as well. So we have this four boundary condition, which is imposed for the displacement, together with another two boundary condition, P2x, P2y, which is also known is going to apply there. So that are the boundary conditions we're going to impose to help you solve in the linear system. Okay? So as what I mentioned here, so these are the boundary conditions. This is how these are derived from. Okay? So that's good. And how to calculate it? Of course, I will not ask you to solve in a linear system by hand, which is a 6 by 6, although I know you have the capability to do that. But think about if you have some of the elements which have thousands of uh, these bars, or even times, sometimes like hundreds of thousands of these truss structures. There's no way for you to really solve it, right? Lattice structure, which is formed by thousands of uh, trusses, is widely used in the lightweight design nowadays, okay? And not only for the aerospace, but also for automobile parts, and even for those general biomedical applications, like you want to a 3D print a man-made bone to replace the original bone. All this widely using those uh, truss structures. So those structures are using thousands or even millions of uh, this uh, truss structure assembled together. How are you able to obtain that? You need to seek the help of a computer program to help you solve the linear system. So, I suppose you learn, not learn, I suppose you're an expert of uh, my lab after your year one course, I hope. Okay? So, I would like to do a little bit survey. Any of you know how to program in my lab? Could you please raise up your hand? No, I mean, those who, who know how to program in my lab. No, don't, don't lie to me. I, 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 I was uh, involved in, in the curriculum design for the new engineering, digital engineering course. I suppose all of you know how to program in my lab. Is that true? I've done tools for engineers that have used it in aircraft performance and design. Yeah, but I, uh, you have a course which covered uh, my lab programming year one, right? Okay, it's good. So, did you learn how to solve a linear system there? Yes, oh, sadly. <laughs> Did you practice this in any other courses before you come to this unit? Yes, I, so, I, I hope so, right? Okay. And then I hope a Milan's course is also going to be used in my lab in the numerical computing. So let's see how we are solving this leading system in my lab. Okay, we have, a, we have a big plan. Like, we're going to change it to Python in the future, but not this year, <laughs> okay? But not for your, for your guys, but so for the coming students. One of the major uh, movements is because there's many, many of the free tools, or free packages available online by using Python, but unfortunately, I have to tell you, like, free things always have some other cost. It's like the performance. The efficiency of solver, which is provided by those free libraries, usually is less efficient compared to MATLAB. Okay, but for student learning, I think that that's good because you can try everywhere. Okay, as long as you have a Google account, you can always log in using the core lab, trying to apply uh, play with your Python code. Okay, so let's uh, do a little bit about MATLAB code. Okay. Sorry, I'm not an expert of my lab. I only use in my lab while I was studying my uh, bachelor. Okay, that's 30 years ago. Okay, so, but uh, 
I suppose you know how to do that, right? Yeah. So this is expand generate terracotta matrix, which is KG1, which is actually derived from what we have. So basically what you did is convert what you written down for KG1 into a matrix. So you define the first matrix of KG1. And then, then think about it like this is quite a tricky part because we don't do the assembly by the to simplify this program, we don't do the assembly in my lab, we already make it a six by six matrix to place all the elements, all the coefficients in the places where they should be. Okay, so this is what we did here. So you will find it like this uh, KG1 is actually a six by six. Why six by six? Because we put it in the system matrix already. Okay, and then we have another element two. We starting from a two by two one. Okay, so this is what I uh, expanded on the, on, the, on the course notes, right? So this one, this one is actually this one, right? Right, okay. So, and then we introduce a transpose, I mean the transformation or rotation matrix. So this one, we have the sine alpha and cosine alpha, right? So we have a, Sine alpha is minus 0.8, cosine alpha minus 0.6. So we have sine alpha, cosine alpha. And then we substitute sine alpha, cosine alpha into a, say, 4 by 4 matrix. Okay? Now you, you have it. So this is a transformation matrix. And then we're using this one to calculating a KG2 which is four by four, but in the global coordinate system, right? So this gives you the global stiffness matrix for element two, but only for node two and three. And then we need to extend it or put it in the back into the system stiffness matrix, right? So that's how we extended this two by two, uh, this four by four matrix into uh, say six by six. So basically all these three lines is to convert it back into a six by six matrix. And then don't forget that like our unit is MN instead of uh, N, right? So basically we times by our median, okay? And we solve it, right? So, but we need to impose the boundary conditions to solve it because the system itself, basically, if it's, it's uh, six by six, it's, it's a kind of, uh, you know, singular matrix, right? So we impose a boundary condition. So these are the boundary conditions, what we imposed. And then we are uh, inverse this, and we're trying to calculate the, uh, the rest of, uh, of displacement, so on and so forth. And we expand it back into the full displacement after you solving the linear system. And then that's the result. So we have, now we have this. And then I would like us, after you have this, I would like a question again. What is the, the force applied to node one? What is the P1x? It's shown here, right? So P1x is a minus, uh, 0.75, and what is P1y? P1y is zero. So that proves for this kind, this is a very important analysis because that gives you the calculation result. When we have a truss structure, which have two bars, we have a force which is pulling down, but for this pin itself, does it have any of those uh, load along the vertical direction? No, right? So that means what? That means if you have uh, some of the material which you want to use the for the wall to hold in this bar, you can, if you have anisotropic materials, you can make it weak along the vertical direction and strong along the like horizontal direction, right? So if you, you I'm not sure whether you learn composite or not. If you're using continuous carbon fibers, that means you can put in, pull in those uh, fibers along the horizontal direction, 
because fibers between the, the fibers is very easy to denominate, right? So along those fibers along the horizontal directions. So all these calculations give you some uh, very important analysis result, which is going to help you to enhance your design. If you have a limited material, you want to reduce the weight, whatever thing, and then the calculation result gives you all these information. Okay? The same, you can, you can analyze here like, oh, now I know the bottom one is very important because if you look at the node three, compare the force which is applied to the bottom compared to the force at the top, this one definitely has much longer, larger magnitude, right? If you have a total force. That means at this point, I need to use a very, very strong material at the bottom compared to the material at the top. So that means if you want to uh, 3D print some of the, uh, like, we call it a functional gradient materials, like different regions, you're able to have different material properties controlled there. That means the bottom one, you need to use more materials, more dense material there. And then for the top, you're able to use in the lightweight material at the top, okay? which is very, very uh, important analysis. Okay? So uh, let's uh, have a short break. And then I'm going, I'm going to change the boundary conditions, making things uh, slightly more complicated. Okay? Thank you. Yes, yeah, okay. Okay. Oh, yeah. Don't give me my but anyway.
Okay. Hello. Okay. Please. Sorry, I'm, I'm trying to find the one who asked me a question about local global transformation just now. Yes, I made a mistake just now. It's a T. It's a, it's a transformation from global to local. Yeah, yeah that's correct. Because uh, to, to find out the global stiffness matrix, you need to convert the global U back into the local U. So T is uh, global to local. Yeah, thanks. And so just now we we already using MATLAB to help you solve in the the system, right? But now we are going to consider about something different. Let's say we have just now there's quite a common questions like does the index of a node matter? If you're using different index of a node, are we all still able to have the same result? Yes, yes, but the steps are different. The other common question is like, how do I determine the orientation of a local coordinate system? I think it's quite arbitrary. You can, you can define that from, uh, for example, the element two, which is shown here. You can either define local uh, coordinate system point from two to three, or you can define a local coordinate system point from three to two which is what we did just now, is like we define a local coordinate system from uh, like the upper one to the lower one, right? But let's see, what if I do here like a point from lo the lower one to the upper one? And then I would uh, go through a little bit about the steps, which is very important to say determine It's quite slow. Let's, let's wait. I think I did it right. OK. So I would like to make it slightly smaller so we have more space. So let's see what we did here. If we have, uh, I only consider about element two here. So we have uh, this bar and this bar. So this is element two. And then this is three, and then this is two, right? So you could define XL along this direction, or you define XL point from three to two. Either way should be fine. But the only thing is like, you need to make sure like, in the element stiffness matrix, because you have this K, K, minus k minus k and then you have i and j you should know that which one is i which one is j okay so if you define xl from 2 to 3 and then 2 is i 3 is j okay but if you define it in an inverse way say let's say okay we define xl in this direction and then although you still have the element stiffness metric in this way, but this time 3 is i, 2 is j. So you should be putting 3 here and 2 here. So that means this element, this element is going to contribute to the location of 3, 3 of the system matrix, okay? And this element is contributed to the location of the third row, second column, third row, second column in the system stiffness matrix, okay? So that are things you need to bear in mind. This index matters because it depends on where, it's going to depend on where you're going to assemble this element into the system stiffness matrix, which is very important. Although you say, oh, this doesn't matter. It's like, this is symmetric here. But there are some unsymmetric elements it's going to introduce slightly later today. Okay, so some of those stiffness matrix is not really 
have only k there. They have more complicated formulas. I will show you a little bit later. Okay. So change index does not really change the element stiffness matrix, but the changing where you should assemble this matrix, where you should assemble all this element into the say uh, system stiffness matrix. So this is the first point I would like to uh, point out here. The second one is like, let's say, if we change the boundary condition a little bit, if you look at left and right, okay, I'm going to use my mouse. So if you have a slider, okay, which is attached on the wall, and you have a spring, which is serve as a buffer, we put it at the bottom. And now you say, what is the boundary condition? The boundary condition will be like for the node three, the displacement along the x direction always zero because it's attached on the wall, right? But for the displacement along the y direction is not zero anymore, it's going to become epsilon as a displacement which you can measure. It. But if you say, what if I not able to measure it then? That's a, that's a different story because think about if you have the spring there, and if you cannot measure it, you need to make it something different because what you want to do, you need to do is like you need to introduce this as the third element, but it's the spring element, right? So if that is the case, what you should do is like you have this is the element, and then you introduce another node here as a node four because you, you have no idea about what is displacement of a node three. Now you have a node four, and you have another spring there, right? Okay, so what are the boundary conditions then? Node three, I only know like, for three, it's uy is unknown, but it's ux is zero. But for this one, not four, because it is fixed. So we know like it's uh, both uh, ux and uy are zero, right? So, and then you need to impose that bounding condition. So it really depends on what is the, the structure, what is the, say, the real scenario is applied there. So different scenario, you're going to apply different bounding condition, which is giving you a total different force. If you say the displacement, what you have here, and then if you have this buffer or without this buffer, the displacement, what you can obtain on the node two is totally different as well, okay? So that is the things you need to consider, okay? Now I'd like to call my computer back. What? What, what I did? Okay, so now we have already covered all those very simple elements. So far, what we have been studies are really very simple elements. It's only have two degree freedoms of the elements. Although we put it into a 2D scenario, we have four by four matrix for element stiffness matrix, but still, again, it's a still two degree of freedom because every node is only moving along those axial direction. There's no movement along the uh, transversal direction. So what happens if you allow the element to move more free degree of freedom? So then we need to model different types of elements. So here I would like to show some of very simple elements. The first is like, the axle bar is what we learned, right? This is basically what we use just now. But we could have a different beam elements. For example, we have shell beam elements, which is four degree freedom. That means this beam, there's no elongation, but only rotation and the vertical direction, right? It's only moving along the vertical. I think for, for those of you who learn the civil engineering, this is what they're using in, in the bridge design. Okay, so something like that. And 
there's a 2 d beam element, so it turns out it have a 6 degree of freedom. That means for each node, we have, uh, say, both x and y displacement and also rotation. So this is the most general scenario of the beam. So that is 2 d beam. Okay? And I'm not talking about if we extend the 2 d beam into the 3 d beam, and 3 d beam has a thin beam and a thick beam, right? So you know that that is, uh, I guess it's, is covered by uh, uh, Professor Chiming Lee or, or someone else. I, I cannot remember. That's solid mechanics course, right? So these are the things what we learn. I suppose you already learned that. No? So what do you learn in those courses then? Stress, strength. Those are the things you learn, right? I guess. Okay. And I hope that is. Uh, that's somehow related to what we are going to cover the next week. Okay. Now, and then, for those of you who already uh, learned uh, lab one, and then for uh, the rest of you is going to have a uh, lab lab one tomorrow and also Thursday, if my memory is correct. But anyway, in this week, and then you need to complete the final element analysis lab two two, and also you need to. Uh, I uh, complete the week two MCQ test before we come to a lecture last week. And also, you need to watch the lecture video for week three. Okay? And again, and uh, our GTA <laughs> asked me to <laughs> highlight this to you guys again because they, they receive a, a large amount of emails during the weekend. So, trying to use in the discussion board because they're going to post uh, some of the common questions there and then. Uh, is to avoid large amount of email, okay? So trying to use in the discussion board. And then I, I, I'm pretty sure like our GTA teams are there trying to help you as soon as they can. But uh, again, without any of the really, really emergency thing, try to avoid sending email, try to use in the discussion board, okay? So this is about assignment. And then this is something, <coughs> hold on for a while. So this is something about I know that some of you already did it, but this is something you need to complete in the laboratory. So basically, again, this is somehow related to uh, what I shown in the lecture notes already, but I wish you could, using your lab, math lab skill, try to solve it a little bit, okay? And then we're going to use ANSYS to really solve the trust problem. And then I would like to also suggest you, if you have spare time, you're also using ANSI to solve this problem, to compare the solution which is obtained by your MATLAB code and the solution which is you obtained from ANSYS to do a certain comparison, okay? Of course, usually your MATLAB code is greatly simplified compared to the, say, uh, uh, ANSYS-based uh, uh, analysis, okay? And then problem three is uh, slightly more complicated. So you will know like fundamental analysis, although it's a software, but software is, does not mean like it's uh, free. Of course, I'm, I'm not talking about the free of uh, the cost of software. I mean the calculation time. So the software also needs a certain amount of calculation time if you're always using the most complicated element, let's say 2D elements here, what I've shown here, or you, if you're solving 3D problems, everything, every problem that comes in, you directly using the 3D solid element that takes extremely long time. So the first thing when you're trying to do the final element analysis is think about like, am I able to do a certain level of uh, simplification? For example, could I simply use in the 2D beam? Or could I further simplify it without using the 2D beam? Or could I simply use in the 3D shell instead of a 3D solid elements? Because if you're using 3D solid element, that means like you always need to create a lot of very small elements to assemble them together. Of course, that's, that's a simple to define that, but it takes extremely long calculation time for some of those problems. So try, that's why what I'm going to practice here, thinking about this 2D problem, 
we're trying to ask you both using, say, different elements. So it's like a beam 188 element. And also, uh, we're going to using a, a 2D elements, say, a play, plan 182 element. So it's trying to use in different elements. And then again, try to compare the difference. Of course, simplification will introduce a certain level of our approximation error, but that may help you speed up the calculation a lot. Because don't forget, no forecast prediction is correct, right? It's like it's always giving you a trend. So as long as the trend is correct, because at the end, the main purpose, the main usage of a finite element analysis as a simulator is not to help you to give you the absolute value correctly. Instead of that, it's going to give you the relative value, the trend. If they give you the correct trend, and then you are able to use in this trend to somehow modify your design, improve your design, and then try to get a better result. At the end, you still need to test your design on a physical model, right? So, that, but finite element analysis will help you to reduce the time for this kind of uh, 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 design improvement and optimization cycle, okay? So this is some things I, I wish you can uh, practice uh, during your uh, laboratory uh, in this week. And then we have uh, um, a laboratory assessment. So this is something you need to answer, okay? So you are able to download all the things on the MATLAB, I mean on the Blackboard, and then uh, you, I suppose you are able to install MATLAB on your old laptop and then you could, you could code by yourself and trying to bring back your memory about uh, MATLAB calculation and somehow helps you to uh, get an answer more easily, okay? So next week, we are going to uh, look at how we can approximate the 3D structures in 2D mathematical model. And uh, we are going to study a little bit about the postal processing. Because right now, you're only calculating the displacement on the node. But displacement on the node does not really directly giving you the answer of some of the questions. For example, is any of those charts going to broke? Or is any of them have a large deformation that's beyond the capability of the material? Okay? Or some other questions. So all those questions does not directly reflect it on the displacement. So it turns out you need to convert the displacement of node into some of the real, like, physical parameters you're able to evaluate your design. So that is generally called poster processing, just like a stress and strain. All those things you need to obtain with the help of a displacement. So those are things we're going to cover next week. And uh, there's a failure criteria for 2D, something like we're going to cover next week. Example of uh, plan stress, plan strand, 2D approximations. But before come to the next week, try to watch the video on Blackboard. Okay, that's a, that's a change of the lectures. And then I'm not going to be here next Monday because of some business trip. I cannot avoid that. So uh, Dr. A.J. Harish is going to cover uh, lecture notes three, the content of lecture three. And then besides of that, I uh, also introduce a little bit about uh, the concept of how final atom analysis is going to help you to generate a lightweight design, which is actually a, a project which I extracted from one of those uh, individual projects supervised by me a few years ago. Students using FEA trying to reduce the weight of a part that they're using uh, in automobile uh, product and keeping the same mechanical property but reduce the weight by using simulation and remove materials in a progressive way. So it turns out they are able to have a lightweight design keeping the same property but uh, much more light. Okay? So I guess uh, this is the last slide I would like to share today. And uh, some of the, I think, the student representative asked me to introduce this to you guys. And then there's a, there's a, a QR code there. If you're interested about that, try to scan it right now. And then you are more than welcome to participate into uh, this uh, 
National Student Space Conference. Okay. Right. Any any questions? Since no no more questions, I I I guess this is all for today. And uh, I wish you can use in the rest of thirty minutes, trying to. Uh, Check your MATLAB and see if you can still run it from your laptop, okay? I think you are going to heavily use it in, in the near future. It's the master. Thank you very much.